All right, thank you, Ruth. Uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, at least today's keynote speaker, and uh, uh, Richard Elmore joined the faculty of Harvard Graduate School of Education in 1990. He's a member of the National Academy of Education and a past president of the Association for Public Policy and Management. Uh, he's held positions in the federal government as a legislative liaison with the United States Congress on uh, educational policy issues. His current research and clinical work focuses on building capacity for instructional improvement in low-performing schools. Uh, he spends at least one day a week in, uh, in schools, which is certainly something, a goal we should all strive for. He works with teachers and administrators on instructional improvement. Uh, he's obviously the author of uh, numerous publications. Now, just let me say, I, I'm allowed to depart because I'm in front of the microphone. Uh, le let me say that we put him under the white lights here uh, when he first came in and interrogated him to learn something about him. And uh, what we found out was that in his free time, he enjoys painting and photography. Now, what was really interesting is what he told us is he thought that it's really a great idea to get engaged in something that you're just not good at, okay? And I was thrilled because now I know why I play golf. So, uh, 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 Dr. Elmore teaches a, a course on leaders uh, of learning and uh, uh, who better to kick off a room full of leaders uh, this morning. So thank you, welcome uh, Dr. Elmore. Uh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about the role that people like you can play uh, in the future of learning. And, and, and I'm, I'm walking a, a fairly uh, difficult path here because uh, from, from my perspective, uh, the future is gonna be very much unlike the present. For those of us who, who think we're involved in the activity called learning. Those of you who are under 40 um, will live a big portion of your professional life in a system of relationships that looks nothing like the one you're in right now. Uh, personally, that excites me because I see amazing uh, possibilities. Uh, it can be frightening, uh, especially, I think, for people who've learned and had to learn uh, to live in, uh, I'll warn you in advance, I I'm a recovering political scientist. Uh, <laughs> what, what we would call in the political organization field a highly institutionalized environment, which is lots of guidance, lots of structure, uh, lots of authoritative relationships. Uh, Any time you need an answer, there's some place you can go to get it. You may have to argue about it, but there's a, a place where you can find the answer. And within that structure, if you do something wrong, there are consequences for it. Uh, we are moving into uh, a world in which the activity called learning uh, is gonna be much, much larger and more complex than uh, the activity called schooling or education. Education is institutionalized learning. And I wanna make this exciting because I think that the people in this room have a unique 
set of capabilities which will help us get through this period in a way that speaks to the scariest parts of it, the social justice parts of it, the equity parts of it, the questions of how privilege is allocated in our society because we're gonna face some big challenges in that area. But before I go deeply into that, I just wanna to talk to you about who I am and what I do. I, I, uh, the, the being in schools one day a week thing started uh, when I uh, felt as if that, and I'll just speak for myself, this is my view of the institution, this is not the institution's view of itself, that, that the institution in which I worked was, was too detached from practice, and that I, w I realized that uh, when I left the public policy school world and stepped into the school of education world, I did so because I wanted to be in touch with real people doing real, real things in real organizations that have consequences for kids. And I realized in my academic work, after 10 years, I, I was not there. Uh, and so I came up with this really simple idea. What is a profession? We pretend to be a professional school. What, what is a profession at the basic, most basic level? And I got interested in the profession of medicine, and so I spent 18 months, uh, this is something you can do when you have tenure, uh, I spent, I spent 18 months crawling around the teaching hospitals uh, and medical schools in the greater Boston area, watching how physicians do work and how uh, physicians are socialized to the practice of medicine. And one of the things that uh, stood out for me was this idea of transparency of practice. That is, uh, your, your practice as a physician and your knowledge, uh, the knowledge you bring to bear on your practice are constantly in the socializing stages of the work, are constantly under scrutiny, and you're always in, in some form of public practice. So that there are ample opportunities to learn the parts of professional work that can't be codified really truthfully, but have to be in some ways systematized. And they're systematized more by culture than they are by rules. So I thought this is an interesting way to start to think about the relationship between education and professionalism. So uh, that swiftly, morphed into this practice called Instructional Rounds, which is now, I've, it's one of those little paper ships I've sent out to sea and it's gone. I do it as part of my own practice, but it's done in networks all over the country. We've written a book about it. Uh, and that morphed in turn into a set of practices that have to do with developing the, uh, uh, coherence of instructional practice in this organization called school. So how, is, how do you construct an effective team? How do you make a collective and binding decision in a team? How does the organization aggregate the results of those collective decisions in a team? What is a strategy? What does a coherent strategy mean? How would we know it if we saw it? So I've been spending a lot of time, in fact, this time last week, I um, was in a district uh, in New York City. Um, these places still exist, you know. The, the median, the district average of proficiency in reading is 17%. I see this all the time in my work. These are the places I work. 
We're about to get involved with a district in which uh, the proportion of kids reading at grade level is 7%. OK. So um, I've been, as a consequence of, the cl of this clinical work in 4,000 classrooms, 350, 400 schools, five countries, but 90% uh, of it has been in US schools and districts, and 85% uh, of that is in districts that are, in schools that are um, on the, in the bottom quartile of the performance uh, metric on uh, standardized tests. I want to talk about, since I've had some time to think about it, I want to talk about two major lessons I think that this work taught me. The first is that educators are hungry for work life and organization, including the physical organization of schools, that give them an identity as professionals. So when we uh, develop the practice of observation, analysis, uh, design, and prescription that the instructional rounds practice requires, that is, people have to work hard at it. You have to learn how to observe without evaluating. You have to learn how to draw inferences from practice and predict what the instruction will produce based on observation, not based on your gut instincts or your preferences or ideology. You have to learn to detach yourself from, the, uh, from what you observe. Um, you have to learn how to argue intelligently. Many of the things that uh, I observe phys physicians doing. Uh, when you do this uh, for... Uh, and with educators, they become incredibly enthusiastic. This is why I got into the field, is the typical comment. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me as a professional. Um, so that's, that's the good news. I mean, we... Uh, often felt, and we've run a whole series of institutes at Harvard, 100 people a pop, but we take people out into schools in the area and we teach them how to do the practice and then we send them back and then we go visit them in their districts. And uh, it's, not, it, it's, it's not hard to get people invested in the practice. That's uh, finding number one. Finding number two, and I'm speaking now from my personal perspective, and I'm not speaking for the colleagues I worked with because I think they might have a different narrative, is the enthusiasm is high and the impact is low. I like to characterize this. If you take you know, the, the uh, 385 schools in the U.S. that I've worked with, it's probably 380 school, uh, five Elmore in the box score. We have a saying, as a famous Massachusetts politician, Fred Salvucci, who was a real operator and also a really sharp and insightful intellect. Uh, Fred Salvucci used to say, culture eats policy for breakfast. So um, what we see, what I see now in uh, 
underperforming schools is uh, is uh, people who are who are teaching their guts out. There's no other way to say it. They're working extremely hard. There there are very 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 few lazy people out there. Uh, there are people who have learned the language uh, of policy and they've learned how to operate in a highly institutionalized environment. They're not very good at what they do. And this is a big challenge, I think, for all of us. Now, granted, I see a particular slice of the system. Where are those schools that, uh, that took off and adopted the practices and did spectacular work? They're, they're, fun, they're primarily not in the US. Um, they're in Canada and Australia where practice was already transparent. So they just now have a practice that's a little more codified way of what they were doing in the first place. So uh, the, the culture in those places is a, is a radically different culture, or at least it has been in the past. Politics are now shifting in both Ontario and Victoria, uh, Australia, Ontario, Canada. But, but so we have a, we have a, um, a fundamental cultural problem in this, in this area called learning. And, uh, how have we solved these cultural problems in our society in the past? Uh, through professionalism. I'm not in denial about policy. I think policy is uh, very important. But policy on the top of a weak and struggling culture uh, rings to mind Fred Salvucci. Uh, So, um, I just did something bad here. This, that's what brings me to what's special about special education. As I look across the, the landscape of American educational practice, what I see when I when I hit the part of the spectrum that has special education attached to it, um, what I see is uh, a much deeper, more complex, more interesting, and variegated relationship between research and practice. A set of expectations that there is uh, technical knowledge that's required to understand and do the work with children with various types of disabilities. And I see people who are attracted to special education because of that. I see a field with a history of uh, political strength, uh, much more sophisticated at mobilizing around substantive questions and issues, and much better at communicating the significance of those, and much better at mobilizing and frankly using the interests of ordinary parents and constituents uh, in a powerful way to influence the institutions and the policies under which you operate. Uh, I see a culture that assumes that people will have a practice A clinical practice is what I would call it, uh, to distinguish it from a more general and amorphous, like leadership practice, but a clinical practice that 
a clinical practice is based on whatever the state of the science is at the time, what we know with some allowance, some confidence intervals. And uh, I think as testimony to what's going on here today, uh, common identity. Um, so that's what I see uh, when I look at special education. When I look outside of special education, I see highly fractured and fragmented identities. I see a world, you know, when you work in extraordinarily low performing schools with people who work extremely hard, you see people who are desperate. They're desperate to find answers, solutions. They want things to work. They want desperately for things to work. And they will take, um, in large part because of their preparation and because of their identity as professionals, they'll take anything they think will work, but it's not a very organized environment in terms of the, the pathways of knowledge into, into practice. So special education is a, is a subculture, it's a strong subculture. It's a subculture that we are going to need in order to face uh, the future of learning. It is not a universal subculture. It's a special group of people focused on a special group of kids with a set of ideas that will prove to be powerful for all kids in the future. And I think that this move that we've been involved in in inclusion is beginning the process of trying to develop to switch from a, a culture which in the language that we use in uh, our clinical work, which is weak in the core, that is in the relationship between teachers, students, and content, the, the, the capacity to make strong predictive statements, to test them in practice, and to revise. It's weak in that uh, special domain and begin to build uh, a defensible culture in these organizations called schools. What do we mean uh, by professionalism? And I'm just going to take the, the uh, standard sociology of occupations definition because I think it works particularly well for our purposes. First of all, a profession is, a, is an identifiable occupational group. We, even though we might have different roles, some of us are university faculty and researchers, some of us are in the independent research sector, some of us lead schools, some of us uh, operate in public agencies for the purposes of the work, we have a common identity. People in this room have a common identity. Uh, but you have to have more than that. Um, you have to have a specialized body of knowledge. And I think this is where special education as a field tends to begin to depart from education in general as a field. It's hard to identify when you go to the Secondary School Principals Association what the identifiable or specialized body of knowledge is. You can, you can when you get together, you can argue about it. Uh, you come from different places, different people have different weights of expertise in different areas, but you can go out here into the bar and have a good, healthy argument. The argument would it would be based on evidence, it would be based on history, it would be based on identity, it would be based on a lot of powerful things. Professions tend to be self-organizing and self-authorizing. When uh, the Congress of the United States deals with the Professional Bar Association or the American Medical Association, there is a clear 
distinction between, or at least there used to be, between who has the expertise and who has the policy authority. That uh, because uh, professions organize themselves and authorize themselves, typically by uh, selection, Professions select their members. They govern the structure by which membership in the profession is created. Uh, they have a particular kind of authority that other types of uh, net networks and organizations don't have. And this, at any given time, results in something you could call standards of practice, which are often uh, codified, but the actual standards are typically, the enacted standards are typically in advance of whatever the codif codified standards are. So part of the role of a profession is to monitor the distance between the actual state of practice and uh, and the standards. And then finally, control of entry, as I said. Uh, now, uh, it may strike you that um, uh, by these criteria, education, as currently defined, isn't professional. And I think uh, it's a work in progress. I like, I like this photograph. A color photograph of men and women sitting around rectangular tables. Notebooks are open and pencils or pens are at the ready. Because um, it reminds me of a week I spent in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, which I think will tell you something about the culture of teaching and learning in Australia. I spent a, I spent a week in a room full of teachers who were actually writing the national standards uh, for teaching, for entry into the teaching profession for uh, the country, basically. Uh, if there were a definition of self-authorizing and self-organizing, that would be it. Uh, uh, standards have real meaning in that context because they come from uh, a culture in which people are expected to be informed and they know that if they don't get the science right at some level, that is at least the current state of what people believe to be the important cause and effect relationships in their occupation, somebody's going to call them on it. And, uh, and uh, I think that that, for me, was a powerful experience of observing people in positions of authority who come from the work of the, of the, of the occupation or the profession itself. I said before that, that uh, professions have practice uh, sometimes broadly defined, in your case, often by, by, uh, by group, by identifiable um, disability, for example. Uh, the practices are at least well enough defined so that if you walk into a classroom and you see something bad going on, <coughs> you at least have a starting point to start to talk about how it could be different and where it could be going. Now, we have lots of people giving advice to teachers in the quote unquote regular curriculum, but the, but the advice is often quite diffuse, in part because the advice givers are not always competent in the areas where they uh, work. Uh, and in part just because um, the way we've defined this relationship between teaching and learning is organizationally just uh, not very um, flexible. 
Uh, I mentioned transparency. You know, I could show you. I'm sure this will strike terror into your hearts, but I could show you a school in Australia that had 138 kids in a single room with seven teachers and two coaches. It worked like a Swiss watch. Every kid in that room was at work on a competency-based project. As a feat of design and pedagogy, the power of adults who use their minds to create an environment where kids could move at their own pace and could feel comfortable in their relationships with adults, Lord forbid they could actually choose which adults to work with. Um, that comes not just from people knowing stuff. It comes from a culture in which people have confidence in what they know. So this idea of clinical practice, if, the, if it sounds too sterile, give it another name, but it's something about systematically developed propositions that help us and our clients understand what the common work is. I'm studying outliers right now, and uh, many of them in third world countries. I study a program called Tutoria in Mexico, which is in 9,000 middle schools, uh, which is, I think, the most powerful educational model outside of an industrialized country that I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, uh, Escuela Nueva in Colombia. Uh, uh, question, why is the literacy rate in Vietnam and Cuba higher than in the United States of America? Good question. Study the practice. Um, but uh, one of the things that impresses me is and I think that we've become a little bit insensitive to this in our culture, is that uh, the big ideas for growth and improvement in big systems are not going to come from the U.S. or developed countries generally. They are going to come from developing countries where people have had to make hard choices about resource use and had to have simple theories that can be shared and transparent to and with their clients. If the students don't buy the practice, it's not going to work in general, I think. And if they're going to buy it, they have to understand it and they have to be partners in it. So our big problem is not so different from the problem that's currently confronting the medical profession, which is how to get the clients involved in wellness, which makes our work as professionals much more powerful. In order to do that, you have to make the work uh, more transparent. Why don't we invite the little doggy into the... <laughs> Uh, so, there are things called professions. Professions have practices. We shouldn't apologize for it because the idea of having a practice entails some kind of relationship and transparency between professionals and their clients. Society is moving in that direction. Uh, we can't avoid it. Uh, our challenge is to help people in the learning sector understand it. Now, what do I mean by the learning sector? And here's where it just, it's going to, we're going to hit, this is like uh, you're flying into National Airport, and it's that last turn, you know, that, that, that funny turn out over the Potomac when you come in over Georgetown, where they have to make that little adjustment before you go down onto the runway. This is that part of the talk. So I'm going to make you feel slightly anxious. 
But the miracle is they generally land. Uh, <laughs> so stay with me for the next few minutes. Uh, for reasons I uh, could elaborate on, I'm not going to. It's a whole different talk. Um, but I am writing about it, so you'll be able to read about it before too long. Uh, we are in a period in which uh, the social activity called learning is diverging from the institutional act, uh, activity called schooling. Now, I like to describe this as we're sort of in, uh, remember the first, uh, I'm, Many people in the audience won't remember this because they weren't either alive or uh, thinking about it at the time. Uh, remember the first Datsun that came into the country? Right? Do you remember the Compaq computer? Do you remember the IBM One? This is the reason I wear glasses, is because that first IBM, which I which I think functioned perfectly well as a boat anchor, uh, had, that, had that screen with green letters, which actually just ate your eyeballs. Uh, so what I'd like to say is that in, in terms of what outside the education sector we call the innovation cycle, we're, we're at the bottom end of that in terms of the way digital culture is going to affect our work. We're way down at the starting point. So uh, if you just think about schooling as a, as a locus for learning, and think about, uh, think about it uh, not, not in terms of the institutions you grew up in and love, the places you go to work, the, the history, the traditions, the football, the, you know, whatever, but just think about it the way uh, an organizational theorist or an economist would think about it. You've got a, a sector that's organized. First of all, it's literally concrete. Literally. Sometimes brick. Always has a lot of concrete. Which means that it's literally place-bound. It's organized hierarchically. Uh, it has high overhead, at least in the United States. We, uh, if you, if you want to see a system that knows how to organize without hierarchy, go to Australia. If you're a principal in Victoria, Australia, uh, this 500,000 students, 1,500 schools, no local school districts. If you're a principal in Australia and you look back at the system, the, uh, there are exactly two people between you and the person who is effectively the chief executive officer of the entire system. Your immediate supervisor, who's a regional official, and that person's boss, basically. As close as you can get to zero overhead. So we've chosen a different model, high levels of local governance, lots of central office and state presence, right, which means that I think uh, people get consulted. They feel part of the process. They're involved. It also means that it's very difficult to get things done, especially the further you deviate from people's standard expectations about how things work. It is also, in terms of the way we've chosen to organize, and one of the reasons why my practice now involves working with an architectural firm, uh, where we do designs all over the world, uh, um, we also have uh, schools that are internally organized in ways that uh, limit and make transparency <coughs> extremely difficult. Uh, the culture in Australia, I'm sorry I'm using so many examples from Australia, but they, you know, the, the way the building, the physical building redesign process started was there were two, two teachers in Geelong outside of 
Melbourne who uh, got frustrated having to go back and forth between each other's classrooms. So they just came in on a Sunday afternoon with a sledgehammer and knocked a hole in the wall. A color photograph of an interior space with rectangular work tables and people seated and standing with laptops open. In the background is a glass walled space enclosing a classroom-like area with individuals seated. That act of defiance created a massive redesign, physical redesign of schools, which is now approaching some 350 of the 500 schools in, uh, uh, in Victoria. Schools that are designed around theories of learning. Schools that are uh, constantly subject to adaptation to changes in understandings and theories of learning. So um, the sector can respond. The question is, is it responding? Uh, and if you think about the way we're currently organized, we are going to grow because of people like you who are deeply committed. Our understanding and our knowledge of learning is going to grow. But because of the way we physically and organizationally designed the structure, we will likely grow at an incremental and linear rate over time. So this is time, this is volume of change and learning. What's going on in the learning sector outside of school is unconstrained by physical uh, affordances. At this point, it's pretty much under, uh, uh, unconstrained by um, uh, barriers to entry. At some point, the empire will strike back. And, uh, uh, but uh, there are you know, you can't tell Sal Khan not to do what he does. He doesn't have to satisfy you. He has to satisfy his clientele. You can't tell K-12 that they got it wrong. Their customers have to tell them that, that they got it wrong. So there's a lot of schlock in the system, much more schlock than there should be. There are very weak and very few mechanisms of control, but what's happening is the rate of growth in that part of the sector is exponential. So you've got this line that's like this, you've got this line that's like that. We're back here at the Dotson compact period. We have time to get out ahead of this. But it's going to mean doing things that we, in the past, have been uncomfortable with. We are also going to be a uh, see a shift from uh, our, our standardized attainment measures. I don't call them performance measures anymore because they're not performance measures. It doesn't, for most kids, it, it doesn't matter at all uh, what, you get, what score you get on the statewide uh, test. It may matter in terms of which school you can go to and maybe even which teacher you get, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is whether you're in the right school, what your family income is, right? And uh, how you do on the SAT or the ACT. So we're in the, the attainment business. We're not really in the learning business. Learning is instrumental to attainment. Hopefully, uh, the two coincide. If you look at the University of California data, you know, they have pretty interesting entry requirements, the A through G requirements. 40% of the kids who, go, who enter, who qualify for entry and attend the University of California have to take non-credit uh, courses to qualify. Uh, for the credit course, credit bearing courses in their, uh, in their regular curriculum. We have 40 to 50 percent uh, completion rates. 
Sooner or later, the system has to shift away from attainment to competence. The, the knowledge and the learning that you accumulate has to be demonstrably connected to something that has value in your personal life. I'm trying to avoid simple economic reductionism. So there's going to be a shift from from a traditional attainment structure. And people in these highly elite, uh, you know, Harvard's going to do fine, right? There's still going to be families who, who don't believe uh, that uh, taking an alternative route through a competence-based network is, a, is real learning. Uh, but for the for the most part, the middle class is not is going to have to is going to have to make this choice. They're not going to be able to afford to make a bad choice. So the shift is moving in that direction. Uh, there are going to be massive problems with executive function and, and attention and focus. Uh, it is going to be the disability, the universal disability of the rising generation. Uh, in part because the, the range of choices <laughs> available to people for learning is going to be huge. And uh, by the selection biases that occur when you're confronted with overwhelming number of choices don't always travel in the same direction. So we're going to have a real set of issues having to do with the, um, the growth of opportunity, and we all know how that works in our society. It works in favor of people who have uh, social capital. So that will be a real challenge. And now we have uh, a major sectoral shift in where the research is coming from. Most of the established professionals in this room came up through a particular kind of training which stressed a particular model of research which has now been institutionalized in our research grant programs, which has to do with a particular way of studying the way interventions work. So we come up with a theory, we develop a prototype, we test it, there are more and less sophisticated ways of testing it. We make judgments about what works and what doesn't. And then we rely on the quote unquote implementation process and the fidelity of the enacted uh, innovation with the prototype to determine whether we're influencing the world. What's happening in the research community is that we're shifting from that model to what I call the wetware model, which is we're actually going inside this three and a half pound organ. We are creating highly controlled uh, observations of what this organ actually looks like when it's learning We've stepped away from the origins of this kind of research, which was primarily studying pathologies. We're now studying things like the infamous infielder problem. How many people know what the infielder problem is, or the outfielder problem? It's an actual simulation of how people, how baseball players catch fly balls. And it's the prototypical case of something called embodied Cognition, which is the end of the Cartesian model of the separation of mind and body. Turns out that the one thing that uh, outfielders had to teach us is that the body thinks faster than the brain under some circumstances. That learning this relationship between the body and the brain will become one of the major challenges to people in the learning sector in the future because right now we have massive amounts of unused capacity in, among learners. 
So these are the three big challenges coming over the horizon. So we got an exponential growth and a linear growth with a shift from attainment uh, to competence, attention and focus challenges, and a redefinition of expertise. I learned something. We do a lot of work in the Central Valley in California with uh, with low-performing schools. Um, it's the most inspirational work I think I do, besides the work I do with uh, uh, educators inside the juvenile correction system in uh, San Diego. Uh, but one of the things they see in the Central Valley is that you know the, the Cal State system and the University of California have built campuses out there, and they're now just full of first-generation college kids mostly Latino. I've come to the conclusion that, and, and at the same time, we all know that California as a public matter of public policy has been disinvesting in higher education for a decade, basically. So the, uh, the uh, campuses are losing resources. Now this photograph is a photograph of Starbucks. A color photograph of a large interior space and multiple tables. People are seated around the tables with books, papers, laptops, and calculators. This is the new University of California. <laughs> These kids, because they've had to deal with schools, that are dysfunctional in many of the same ways that uh, universities are, are perfectly fluent in digital culture. It's also highly individualized. They work in small groups, but they also do highly individualized work. And they have learned how to manage their relationship with formal institutions in such a way that they uh, monopolize very little of their time. Uh, I have a shirt tail relative uh, who's in uh, his uh, second year of medical school at Brown. He, it said, he said it took him two weeks to discover in his first year of medical school that it was a waste of time to go to class. The curriculum is perfectly accessible online. It's all head packing. Uh, he's much more efficient at doing it. This would be a really demoralizing place to be a professor. <laughs> Hello, is anybody there? <laughs> so we're clearly going through some kind of a transformation. The way I like to describe it is, the, the part of the learning process that involves the transfer of information from one place to another is going to become radically more efficient. And the rest of the process, which we have assumed is kind of the enabling of that transfer of information, is going to become much more important. And the neuroscience of the relationship between affect and learning, that is, creating the social conditions under which it is possible for people who are not fluent at assimilating information through simple transfer. And the whole idea of engaging people who've had bad experiences, who've been traumatized by learning, or many of the students who I deal with, people for whom schools have not worked, for whom schools are toxic places. Everybody in this room should read Mark Katz's book called Children Who Fail in School and Succeed in Life. Mark is a clinical psychologist and he just takes you through the process by which people who have been basically demeaned and disabled by school develop their capabilities 
and the kind of intermediations and affordances they use to become part of the mainstream uh, of society. These are the sorts of things we're going to need to understand, probably from a neuroscience perspective, uh, in order to get our hands around it. Just because you have a really good handle professionally on clinical practice doesn't mean that there isn't a whole population of kids out there who aren't being served by an attainment-driven institution. Our job, collectively, is, is, is to begin to expand your practice in the domains in which you work, the culture around individualization, the culture of understanding how human beings work in this activity called learning, and the culture of developing incredibly quick and efficient adaptive uh, relationships to uh, kinds of learning problems that we cannot anticipate until they come up. Those are the sorts of things you are good at. Those are the sorts of things that have to do with learning as much as they do uh, with special education. But to do so, I think, uh, involves stepping back a bit from the sector. And to begin to think of yourselves as leaders of learning. You have an experience. Uh, but it's been a highly institutionalized experience. Most of the learning that's going to go on in society is not going to be in this highly institutionalized setting. But you still have the social capital and knowledge to make it possible now for very large numbers of young people to function perfectly well uh, as learners in a society in which the ground rules are changing. So you've got this problem of uh, uh, how do you exercise your responsibilities within the existing institution according to the institutionalized rules under which you operate? Uh, you also have a body of expertise which society needs. The uh, presenting location of which is not necessarily in the schools in which you work. It's society's problem. It's society's bro broader problem. You also have a situation in which the science is changing. Uh, the center of gravity over what constitute useful knowledge in the sector will change dramatically. It won't do away with the kind of research that we've used in the past. It's just going to become much more complicated to understand how knowledge works. And we have the additional problem that uh, neuroscientists aren't real crazy about practice. Right? So in my MOOC, uh, my Harvard X course, uh, I've tried to showcase two neuroscientists who are on this project, Todd Rose and Judy Willis, who've actually taken the expertise and turned it in the direction of the creation of a culture of practice. But that is a big project that we have to, uh, have to get on with. So your challenges are uh, how to occupy the space, in this growth curve. Got, we've got some warning, but because it's exponential, we don't have much warning. How to bring your experience with professionalism and clinical practice into the mainstream of discourse about learning. How to stand up and take your place in this discussion about where learning is going to happen and how it's going to happen and who is going to be served by it. And how to blend your variety of expertise, your particular competencies with a more user-driven system. 
You're good at consulting your clients. I think educators in general have a general aversion to thinking in terms of markets and individual preferences and satisfying consumer demand. That's understandable, but it's going to have to become more part of your understanding of your work. I wanted to conclude with this photograph, which for me is very inspirational. A color photograph of two young people at right next to a preteen boy wearing glasses and laughing while seated on an oversized chair with a tall, flat back. There is a black cushion on the back section as well as a wide X-shaped strap wrapped around the boy's chest. The kids on the right-hand side of the photo, uh, photograph come from a radical uh, learning organization in Cambridge called New View which is a design studio that takes kids between the ages of 14 and 17 and puts them through a design thinking lab that's uh, six weeks long. And some kids stay forever and actually graduate from New View. One of the things that the New View kids did, and they do this routinely, is they uh, developed a design project with a community in Mexico that had kids with severe cerebral palsy. And the design project was, it's a typical New View project, how to develop uh, mobility tools that could be useful to that community that did not require huge investments in uh, and purchase of things on the international market, which are way too expensive for people. So the project was a project around the students working with members of the community to actually develop and build the mobility devices, rather than to make the community dependent on devices that come from the outside. Two points. This is something 14-year-olds can do. I've seen manifold examples of that. Point number two is we can put kids in the world in powerful ways that make learning and the consequences of learning and the consequences of making this, crossing this divide between kids with learning problems of various kinds and our culture more powerful. And so that's my aspiration for, for special education. You have enough work to do, I'm sorry. But I'm also excited about the fact that uh, 10, 20 years from now, when I'm gone, the world is going to look very different as a learning society. And I think that you people have very special competencies and very special uh, brains to work on this problem. Welcome to the party. Thank you.